back by popular demand. Dr. Robert M. Price is the Bible geek, answering your questions about the Bible and other religious texts. Welcome to the show. Welcome indeed. Tis I, the Bible geek. And uh, so um, we're going to, I don't have to fill up the uh, the airspace with too much gibberish uh, because we've already got some good questions. Uh, and uh, some of these are uh, really, really good. Uh, Z Stallone says, do we know anything about the judges system? Uh, um, was it historical or did Israel always have a king? And if it wasn't historical, how did the myth come about and evolve? Well, uh, I, I guess you can only go so far back, uh, even with the archaeological remains we have, but I get the impression that the judges' um, material is more likely to be historical than the monarchy uh, stuff, because... Um, or, or the Joshua stories. In other words, I'd say uh, out of all the Deuteronomic histories, you know, uh, um, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, it's probably the stuff in Judges that it has the best uh, claim on being historical. And one big reason for that is the whole thing in Joshua has uh, Joshua having this continuous blitzkrieg in Canaan, just steamrolling uh, city state after city state. And uh, you get the impression they just wipe the place clean of its original inhabitants. But at the end of it, Joshua is depicted as saying, well, you know, there's still a lot of land to claim here. And he starts naming off stuff that they haven't claimed. And, and the whole thing looks, wait a second, I thought you guys pretty much uh, emptied the joint. Well, this is, I think, is kind of a wink to the reader saying, well, not really. You see, all of that stuff was really kind of allegorical to, to uh, tell the readers, in, and of course, obviously a much later time, that uh, they should not go back to the ways of the Canaanites, because what they were really trying to say was, this was us. We were Canaanites. Uh, and there may never have been any uh, introduction to Egypt or an exodus out of it, but uh, they it's pretty obvious the religion of ancient Israel was indistinguishable from, from the religions of Baal and so forth in Canaan. And uh, so it's presented in these books as if that is as if that uh, the Israelites were being, uh, assimilated into the conquered people, uh, the ones that were left, which seems to have been just about all of them, uh, and uh, that the prophets were always saying, hey, hey, Moses told you not to do this. Uh, cut it out because God um, predicated his being, his having your back with your holding up your end of the covenant, which meant worshiping only him. And, and uh, no more uh, idols, no more polytheism, and no more sacred prostitutes, etc. What are you doing? Uh, and um, what they had to, what they were trying to do was to explain in a contrived way how um, they could reconcile their revisionism, saying that Moses already taught monotheism and uh, no idols, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with the fact that the stories they had of earlier times belied that, that they depicted the uh, the taken-for-granted Israelite religion, which was identical with that of their fellow Canaanites. The stories are, are very frank in saying that the Israelites were related to the Moabites, the Ammonites, uh, and so on and so on and so on. There were all these things about who was related to whom and how each of them uh, eventually begat whole leagues of Canaanites Canaanite nations. Uh, they, they're admitting on the one hand that, yeah, we were just Canaanites and idolaters like uh, everybody else, um, but uh, they're trying to say, uh, well, we knew better, but uh, they're, they're just, as scholars like to say, retrojecting the Deuteronomic reform religion back into their past as if they had already known that was the truth, but kept backsliding away from it. 
Uh, so the Joshua thing, where they cleared out the joint uh, of all the, the nasty pagans, uh, really functioned as a kind of a Pilgrim's Progress symbolic narrative uh, telling people, hey, uh, be ruthless, uprooting the any vestiges of the old religion, because we're still plenty of people that believed in it, and said, no, 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 do not tolerate that. Have a zero tolerance policy, and uh, let's live according to the actually new uh, Deuteronomic uh, monotheistic beliefs. Uh, so um, when in that light, when you look at the judges right after uh, the book of Joshua, you don't get the impression there was this tidal wave of, uh, uh, of this uh, monotheistic jihad. Uh, what do you see? Well, there's a frame narrative that once again said, oh, they knew better, but they kept falling back into paganism. But that's, and, and so when they did, God would say, hey, I told you, now I'm going to let the Canaanites beat the hell out of you and subjugate you until you accept the wake up call I'm giving you. Well, eventually they would and they would repent and God would say, okay, now I'm going to help you. And uh, the judges, these charismatic leaders that really had no government authority because there was no government of the whole place, as it freely says, right? Um, they would come to the rescue of Israel, but it wouldn't last. Uh, eventually they'd get, you know, at ease in Zion, as the saying goes, and they would go, they'd lapse back into, uh, into idolatry. If you look at each of those stories of Gideon, Samson, Jephthah, etc., etc., you realize these people are not uh, repenting of sin and then regaining their own autonomy. They are gaining it for the first time by overthrowing Canaanite landlords. Uh, it's originally these were tales of Israelite heroism, how they attained their, uh, their uh, freedom and autonomy through heroism. But uh, the, they put on it this artificial framework, like really sticking uh, square pegs into round holes and telling you before showing you, right? Telling you that, yeah, we were apostates, but we repented and then God helped us. He sent us a savior. That doesn't fit the actual story. So that tells me that that the idea of, um, of uh, Joshua just fumigating the Canaanites and then shortly thereafter, Israel asking for a king, because how that happened, you remember, uh, there was this problem with uh, the Ammonites uh, conquering one of the tribes, and they were about to gouge their eye, one eye out as a mark of servitude. And this came to the attention of Saul, who was a patriot, and he said, hey, we're not letting that happen. And he summons all the, the tribes of Israel who were independent of one another and says, let's get together and put a stop to this. What do you say? And it worked. And they said, hey, we could use a guy like this as a king. What, do you, what about it? And they went to Samuel, a prophet and a judge, said, isn't it about time we had a king? I mean, it's, it's an efficient system. We couldn't have done this without the leadership of Saul. And uh, Samuel says, well, if you insist, but um, uh, you're going to regret it because kings notoriously exploit and oppress their people. Saul may look good to you today, but you're going to be sorry. No, 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 we'll, we'll take the risk. All right, uh, God doesn't want it. I don't want it, but uh, we'll, uh, you know, give you enough rope to hang yourself. And then Saul displeases him and, and David takes over and then Solomon and the, the kingdom splits and all that. So the, the, uh, sto the individual stories in Judges with Jephthah, Gideon, Samson, etc., uh, those are probably giving us something more like what actually happened that uh, the Israelites, who were simply one more group of native Canaanites, fought for their independence and gained it and then federated. 
uh, there's this arrangement they had all over the ancient Mediterranean called the, this is a tongue twister, an amphictyony. I guess it works better in Greek, um, which it's because Greeks is too. They would have a confederation of independent tribes uh, and what united them was the worship of a central deity. They may have, they probably had their own uh, specific tribal gods, but they, they would worship one um, federal god, and he would have a central shrine, and they would have either six or twelve tribes joining together. If it was twelve, each tribe was in charge of the upkeep of the central shrine for a month. If it was six, as it sometimes was, each tribe would have it for two months, obviously, you know, on the opposite sides of, of the year. And uh, this uh, seemed to be what was happening in ancient Israel. Uh, it, it wasn't a, a matter of the progeny of, of 12 sons of one man, Jacob. That was a genealogic myth like everybody used back then. If you made an alliance with somebody, it was sort of like Western, where, you know, we blood brothers now. Uh, and they would adopt the legal fiction, like an adoption, kind of, saying, yes, we are all uh, brothers, and their, their symbolic ancestor would be, you know, maybe somebody who had lived, maybe not, uh, Jacob in this case, but there were loads of other ones, even in the Bible, Ishmael and, and others. Uh, and um, if you look at the names of the tribes of Israel, some of them weren't even personal names before. There was no guy named Ephraim originally. That's a word meaning those who live on Mount Ephrath. Or, or other ones had, or uh, Ishakar, however you say it. That means a uh, hired laborer. Uh, so that group, you know, what, what they were doing. Uh, others were named after their favorite deity, uh, like Gad, the, the tribe of Gad. Gad was the god of good luck. And so they were named for him. Zebulun, uh, at least I, I haven't uh, researched this, but I, I think it's pretty obvious that they worship the god Zebul, uh, who later becomes Beelzebul, and so on and so on and so on. So these weren't even necessarily personal names until they personified the, uh, the particular tribe based on their distinguishing characteristic. Uh, so I think if we have anything that's historical, it, it's at least the germ of the various narratives in Judges. Now, some of them are plainly simply mythological, like Samson. Uh, he was simply the sun god, uh, as, as is obvious from all the things he does that involve fire and, and so on. And... Um, but some of them might have been real. Jephthah is much like Agamemnon, who has to sacrifice his daughter to get victory in war, so that's probably just a myth. But some of them might have been uh, real, but at least that kind of thing very likely happened. Uh, all the stuff about uh, Sam, Samuel, I mean, uh, Saul and uh, David and all that stuff, uh, that seems to be fiction, and it, largely because it's not backed up by archaeology. There is no temple of Solomon, no palace of David, because it's pretty specific where they're supposed to be, and they're not there. You know, there's, you, you couldn't just have no ruins left of those things. Uh, and Solomon, was there a Solomon? Well, yeah, he was actually Shalmaneser III, an Assyrian emperor. Uh, all the stuff about Solomon is borrowed from the facts about this guy. Uh, and so it's, it's not really historical. Uh, and um, the, the, the monarchy stuff. And Israel was a monarchy for a good while, but Judah wasn't until late in the day, and there was never a United Kingdom. So most of the Deuteronomic history is, is really uh, legend and fiction, sometimes nationalistic um, myths and so on. Now, where they got the, uh, the th though I'll tell you one thing where it says uh, that the Israelites pled with, with uh, 
Samuel to give them a king like the surrounding nations, that kind of rings true. Uh, because you, you certainly have the same sacred king ideology shared by Israel, the Canaanites, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and, and so forth. Uh, so they were they went along with the flow, because if you had a monarch, he had to be the sacred king, the vicar of the chief god on earth. And uh, so they probably did, once they decided to have a monarch, just adopt the, the myths that went, went with it. So there's some hints of at least earlier strata uh, of the uh, myths we read in the Bible, but it doesn't really get historical until pretty late in the day. Uh, we have uh, extra biblical mentions of the house of Amri, which is, he was one of the main kings in Israel up north. And so we know they existed, but, uh, you know, where did they come from? Uh, were there uh, original kings anointed by the prophets? Who the heck knows? I mean, if you have a, uh, a story involving Elijah and Elisha, uh, the alarm bells ought to go off because those guys are personifications of the sun and the moon. They're not historical figures. Uh, and even the guys like Isaiah, Jeremiah, etc. These, these books seem to be later literary compositions, not collections of oracles. We, we have one of those, not in the Bible, the prophecies of Balaam. He is a biblical character in the book of Numbers, but they kind of borrowed him, whether he actually existed or was a legendary figure, who knows. But he was a Canaanite um, prophet, and the a, a set of his oracles survive, and they're all just very brief maxims kind of like the stuff the Oracle of Delphi said. You, you don't have the elaborate poetry of, of Isaiah and Jeremiah and all of these guys. And they, that's probably literary productions uh, much later on. So uh, th this is why you have Old Testament minimalism today. Uh, the, the, the Old Testament is just great, great literature in many ways. Um, and that's more important to me than the history, which we don't really have. Sorry for going on so darn long, but uh, it's a tricky thing. Uh, Peter Rabbit uh, says, following up on Z Stallone, were the patriarchs, um, Adam and Eve, uh, considered Jewish? Uh, how and when did Judaism begin? Well, I think we have a pretty good answer to that that is more quickly told. Uh, Judaism, as we know it, had uh, had uh, a kind of two roots and two phases close together. The Deuteronomic reform, so-called, which is told in a kind of a beefed up way in the Bible, that uh, that um, Huldah and uh, a prophetess and I uh, can't think of the guy's name, a, a priest and a couple of other people were uh, going, supposedly, they were going through all the, uh, uh, blowing the dust off of old Sunday school registers and uh, all the kinds of stuff in the temple. And, <laughs> and say, hey, well, what is this? And uh, they find the Book of the Covenant, which appears to have been the core of, of the Book of Deuteronomy. And so, Oh my gosh, look at this. According to this, we're not supposed to be worshiping any other gods, etc., etc. We could be in big trouble here. So they go present this to King Josiah, and they read the whole thing as he sits there increasingly depressed, thinking, oh, good God, uh, we're going to be lucky if God... God doesn't nuke us like he did uh, Sodom. Uh, and he says, okay, it may be too late, but let's try to enact all these reforms, which we, I guess we should have been doing all along. But in fact, this was a new agenda. Let's uh, get rid of all the polytheism and stuff like that. Let's get rid of the statue of the serpent god in hushed and put it out in the garbage. Uh, kick out all those Assyrian deities we, we have chapels for in the temple. Let's get rid of uh, Astarte, the bride of Yahweh. No, no. According to this, we should never have had this in there. 
Of course, this was all new, actually. So they came up with this streamlined version of Israelite religion, banning divine images and the sacred prostitutes and this and that and the other thing. And it was too little too late, according to the Bible. Uh, they, uh, the Assyrians conquered them anyhow and, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, this was really about something, I think, in the middle of the second century BCE. It was the Hasmoneans, uh, uh, Mattathias and uh, Judah, Maccabee and, and his brothers, that they pretty much created Judaism based on this. And then uh, uh, already Zoroastrian influence had entered into the stream. Uh, you even find it in an uh, an off-site temple in Egypt where they were worshiping Ahura Mazda and various other gods. And so with the addition of uh, a heavy dose of Zoroastrianism, uh, if you could say that in the middle of the second century uh, that, uh, that Judaism as we know it began and then was further developed and then consolidated after the uh, war with Rome and uh, that uh, w when uh, the rabbis uh, took over, because they were the only authorities left after the slaughter. So I think we can date that pretty pretty uh, easily. Now, whether you want to... Now, it's interesting that uh, with the patriarchs, they're not called Israelites, as I remember. They're called Hebrews, uh, which is sort of pre-Israelite. Uh, there was no kingdom of Israel yet, but they were looked back uh, on as the ancestors. And then you, you can, it's like Abraham is like Adam and Eve. Um, at least the way we usually interpret it, Adam is supposed to be the first man. So he's the ancestor of everybody. If you wanted to say, oh, he was an Israelite, you'd have to say he was everything else too. Uh, but, of course, they didn't know how many nations there were in the world, uh, though there are some now that say uh, that Adam was originally, even in the Bible, understood to be the progenitor only of Israel, that Adam and Eve were the first creations of Yahweh, whereas other gods were creating their own populations uh, over in the other countries, uh, that uh, if if the Israelites had Adam as the first, well, I think originally they had Enosh as the first man, and their neighbors in Edom had Edom or Adam as the first man, and the Israelites borrowed him, but everybody had their own first man, which explains where Cain got his wife. I think, uh, as Russell Gamerkin explains it, he solved the riddle. It was just like in Plato's Timaeus. The, the high god, the creator, created the lesser gods, his children, and each of them had his own country and created his own population and uh, intermarried with the most beautiful human he had created. That was the sons of God and daughters of men, etc., etc. So that big Bible mystery has been solved. So if you wait long enough, you know, you don't even have to get to heaven to find out. Uh, ingenious scholars may come up with that. Uh, let's see, who is this? Uh, um, uh, Constellation Pegasus. Uh, the Hebrews saw the Red Sea parted and the destruction of an Egyptian army. Soon after, they for, uh, forgot and made a golden calf. No way such a short memory uh, happened to a miracle. Uh, Aaron's excuse making the calf is sadly weak also. Uh, yeah, but keep in mind when Aaron unveils the golden calf, which really is a kind of mythological retrojection of um, King Jeroboam, uh, creating a golden calf idol in the Israelite northern temple at uh, Bethel. In both stories, uh, Aaron and Jeroboam says, Israel, behold your God who delivered you out of Egyptian bondage. Uh, so um, they apparently thought they were making an image of Yahweh. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, and, and uh, uh, what does Aaron say when Moses says, the Lord God has said nothing concerning parade floats or whatever he actually said there, uh, that um, uh, Aaron says, uh, hey, uh, if, uh, you know, I, I wasn't really a party to this. Uh, they said they wanted uh, an image of God. And I said, well, who knows what he looks like? Uh, so I said, hey, let's just throw the gold into the smelting furnace and see what comes out. Let God decide how he's to be represented. And lo and behold, this is what came out all by itself. Uh, that's presented as a ridiculously, as you say, lame excuse. But in the original story, that's actually what happened. No one has ever seen God. So how are we going to know? Uh, well, he knows, so let him choose it. Um, last night, I think I mentioned this, like in Ghostbusters, choose the form. Well, it, well that was up to, to uh, uh, the uh, Gozer, the traveler himself, uh, Yahweh. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it, well, it's lame, especially the way it's been rewritten, because the person that wrote it was uh, influenced by the Deuteronomic reform, so that, oh, no. God could not have said, hey, I'd like to be uh, depicted this way. <laughs> oh, no. God gave Moses a commandment saying, do not make any image of me. And so, well, uh, that couldn't have been, uh, uh, couldn't, that doesn't square with it. So it must have been a lame excuse. Um, so they did, according to the story, they did remember and were grateful for the deliverance from Egypt. It's just the question of wanting to memorialize it with a statue of the God who rescued them. Uh, it's yet really have to untangle the layers, but I think it can be done. So, okay. Uh, good question. I think I am, uh, probably skipping some, um, uh, Tony G says, how do we get all these different ethnicities from the eight survivors of the flood? Uh, well, uh, one biblical answer to that is the Tower of Babel. You had the, the originally unitary uh, ethnos uh, of the, uh, the crea of Yahweh's people um, and that got along fine until uh, Yahweh uh, is uh, starting to get worried. Uh, he didn't think these these chimps that he made, these, as I say, lemurs in neckties, uh, were, were going to be able to do much of anything. But when he saw him working on this skyscraper, he said, holy mackerel, I, I never thought they could do anything like this. Uh, we better uh, nip this in the bud, my fellow deities. Now, how are we going to do that? Oh, hey, they couldn't work together if suddenly they were all speaking different languages. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. And so uh, uh, Ishmael over here says, uh, hand me that hammer. But uh, uh, Mahalalil says, what? You want a slice of pizza? Uh, and uh, so they, they can't work anymore. They, they can't even live together. So they all split up and go their separate ways and start all the, the 70 nations of the world listed in chapter 11. So that was their answer to it. But really, uh, that, uh, that's a rival view uh, from the one you have in uh, Deuteronomy 32, right, where God himself slices the pie of nascent humanity so he gives his various godlings each his own fiefdom so again you got different myths it wasn't like they didn't have tv and uh, you know, they can't send the memo to everybody else get on board with this so you had rival views of a lot of things um, uh, Tony G, didn't God violate Pharaoh's free will when he hardened his heart? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And uh, because he must have done it because the story wants to have Pharaoh beaten into the ground to show that he's the mighty king of the mighty empire. He's nothing before God. God can toy with this guy. He makes Pharaoh into one of these things like, like an inflatable boxing partner, right? I'm sure you've seen these, right? They, they're on some kind of flat platform. So every time you smack them, 
they not they fall over, but then boom, they, they come right back to standing. That's what he makes Pharaoh into. He says, I want to keep uh, smashing this bastard. Uh, so he, he puts it in his mind after he's beaten him to hell. Uh, uh, he, he says, uh, hey, maybe you should try it once more. What do you say? I mean, you, you're not going to let them get away with this, are you? They humiliated you. I've sent all kinds of plagues. Maybe you should say you should get your licks in one more time. Go ahead. And and so old Yule Brenner's there saying, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I can't admit defeat before this bunch of slaves. Hey, you know what I said about you going free? Forget it. Uh, you're serving me. Uh, and, uh, and uh, oh, really? Uh, Moses says, I thought you learned your lesson, Yule. And uh, he, he uh, sicks another plague on him again and again and again. I mean, he was willing to let him go long before, but he's trying to make a, a it says he's trying to make a Pharaoh into a, um, a uh, what would you call it? Uh, uh, he's trying to make an example of him. Hey, uh, you pagans, don't think your God can uh, can beat ours. Uh, he can uh, just make a clown of your so mighty king. And so, yeah, he certainly does treat him as free will. <laughs> Who cares? I'll hypnotize the guy. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, he doesn't really uh, care about that. He's just a, a stage villain. He's just snidely whiplash. And the more he's abused and ridiculed, the better. Uh, Got to have a little uh, sympathy for uh, at least the way he's uh, depicted in uh, the Moses movie. I think the wise serpent something to say. Yeah, you know, we have a question from uh, Henrietta. She didn't want to talk on... Um She's watching, but she didn't want to talk on uh, here for some reason. Uh, she was a little nervous. Uh, mm -hmm. She wanted to, she's got to, okay, I'll read exactly what uh, she texted me, okay? Um, mm -hmm. The temples in the Bible, okay, mm -hmm. King Solomon was he or was not he a real person? Um, and did the Persians build the temple in um, Jerusalem? And why were the Pharisees called the Pharisees? Doesn't that mean Persian? Ah, uh, all good questions. Um, uh, Russell American has shown, I think, beyond reasonable doubt that there was a Solomon, but he was a borrowed character. The historical Solomon was Shalmaneser, the, uh, the third, uh, an actual... Assyrian emperor and Shalmaneser is the same name really as Solomon just with a suffix uh, both are named for Shalman the god of the sunset and um, Ezer means help so uh, Shalmaneser means Shalman is my help uh, like you know uh, Ebenezer Scrooge uh, he says uh, that means stone of help it's he's named after a monument in the book of uh, of Joshua. A uh, hitherto he he sets up the monument. He says, up to this point, uh, Yahweh has helped us. So this is the stone of help. Well, Shalmaneser is Shalman is my help. Uh, naturally, a king is going to say that. I I'm I rule at them by the grace of God, and he backs me up. Well, he is described uh, pretty much in terms of all the stuff that the Bible attributes to Solomon, the great king. So they just put him in the wrong uh, setting. Uh, he, he was not a Yahweh worshiper, and he wasn't in Israel, but he was just up north, right? Now, um, uh, let's see. As turn and you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian conqueror, destroyed the the Jerusalem temple, assuming there was one. I mean, a bit later there was a temple in Judah, but not Solomon's. Uh, but he destroyed whatever temple there was. And once the Persians, uh, Cyrus the Great and his uh, buddies, conquered Babylon, 
uh, they had a different policy for uh, the religions of subject peoples. They didn't insist, hey, you got to worship our gods from now on. I mean, they beat your gods, didn't they? I mean, that's how we won. Uh, but the, the Persians said, no, no, you, uh, your worshiping is your business. In fact, we would like to help you get back on your feet with your religion. Uh, so we're going to bankroll the, the reconstruction of your temple, or at least a temple. And so they sent a couple of Jewish uh, nobles who had risen to uh, authority in the Persian government, Ezra and Nehemiah. They sent them there uh, with uh, plans for the temple and for reorganizing Judaism. And it was an alien thing to the Jews or the Israelites, whatever, who were left there, who had never gone to Babylon. And they said, hey, we'll join you. And they said, oh, no, you won't. Uh, what? And uh, the, because they were imposing uh, a Persianized form of Judaism, namely, basically Zoroastrianized. And that's why you had all these Zoroastrian elements that suddenly appear in post-exilic Judaism. It's not hard to figure out where they came from. And that's why Pharisee is best, under, best understood as you understand it, meaning Persian, uh, Parsi. Uh, the uh, remaining Zoroastrians today persecuted to death their ancestors in uh, uh, Islamic Iran, they took refuge in India uh, where they weren't persecuted and uh, they were known there as Parsis because of their Persian origins. Well, apparently, uh, since Judaism had been Persianized, Zoroastrianized, if that's the word, uh, they, uh, the, the Jews who accepted this uh, were mocked by others like the Sadducees who were old time religionists who didn't a resurrection from the dead. What are you crazy? Um, and all of this stuff that, that they've gotten from from the Ezra and Nehemiah and, and company. And they said, you, you guys are not even really Jews anymore. Uh, why don't you admit it? You're, you're Persians. You're Zoroastrians. Well, uh, they, uh, the Pharisees were convinced of this stuff. I mean, it sounded pretty good to them. And they, they however, decided to redefine the name. You call us uh, Parsis, I, I guess we can't get rid of that. But, you know, we're, we think uh, it, it should mean Perushim, separated ones, you know, from, from all you unholy folks. Uh, so it, it's like saying we're the Puritans. They redefined it, just like people do all the time with uh, Methodists. That was a slur at one point. Eventually they said, well, okay. You want to call us that? That's fine. Or queer, right? That used to be a nasty insult. But now, hey, no, we're here and we're queer. Uh, we're proud of it. You may think it's bad. We don't. Uh, and so that apparently is what happened. So I think you are right on target. Ooh, see, here's a goodie um, from uh, Peter Rabbit. Uh, I'm curious, do you think you'll ever believe in God again? Do you still pray? Um, you seem to be a highly spiritual person. I appreciate that. I have to tell you, uh, I, I used to be a pastor. I was a witnessing evangelical. But I, uh, I no longer can define what spirituality is even supposed to mean. Uh, it's a total mystery to me. Uh, so I don't know if I'm spiritual or, or not, though I, I am honored by your what you say. I really appreciate that. But is there a God? Uh, I'm a, a member of Atheists for Liberty. I almost regret having an explicit connection to any atheist group because most of them are a bunch of jerks uh, that are trying to offend Christians and, and Jews and others. And I, I really hate that. Uh, they, they tend to uh, say, you know, I don't think people hate us enough. Is there anything we can do to become more odious to the public? I, I want nothing to do with that. 
but I really don't think there is a God such as is described in the Bible or in the Iliad and the Odyssey. I don't really see much difference between Zeus and Jehovah. Uh, I, I just can't believe there is this genie floating around in, uh, up in the sky. Uh, so I don't buy that. Uh, I'm not sure I am even an idealist metaphysically in the, in the sense I would have to be to say, like with Tillich or with Spinoza or Schleiermacher, that yes, there is being itself that the God is, is a symbol for the real God who is the ground of being, not a being. Right? That, that implies you think there is a spiritual, non-physical, non-material realm. I can't get that straight. I, I'm not sure what that would mean. Uh, and uh, so... And, and it's not because, oh, I'm so smart. I know better. Look, no. Well, the thing like that, how could I know? It, it would all be speculation. But uh, I uh, revere the mystery of the universe. Look at the night sky. You know, you're seeing flaming stars hugely bigger, unimaginably bigger than our sun, which is unimaginably bigger than us, right? Uh, uh, you're, and, and there's like a universe full of galactic clusters, each of which has billions of galaxies. Uh, so far from one another, you can't even imagine it. And each galaxy has billions of individual stars that are infinitely far from each other. And here we are, uh, microbes on one little mud ball around a middle-sized uh, star, and we, we've we only been here a few minutes in the cosmic scale of things, right? We, we're evolved from, from lemurs uh, way, way before us. The, the, the earth was the property of clashing dragons, dinosaurs. And before that, ferns were the dominant species on earth for zillions of years. It, it's like in uh, Monty Python. On some meaning of life makes you feel sort of insignificant, doesn't it? But the, the real clincher to me is childbirth. I think the stork thing is much more plausible than what actually happens. If you think about it for a second, wait a minute. Uh, people gestate inside other similar people and then come out of that body and grow up to adulthood when they can do the same thing. This is like unbelievably weird. Uh, so what this is the kind of thing that makes people say, you think this came about by accident? That's absurd. I sympathize with that, but I'm not cocksure that it couldn't happen by accident. I am just baffled. I stand in awe. Is there an intelligent designer? I don't know. Uh, all I can say is that I must be humble like Isaiah in Isaiah 6. Uh, woe is me, I am undone. So it, that's not a belief in God. It, it's a, a sense of wonder and awe, which I gather really may be the essence of religion. But I can't define it. That, that is to defile it, to make it into an idol. So I don't know. Is there a God? What, what, what does God even mean? You got me. So I am really wide open. I don't believe in any religion, but all of them seem to do the job they're trying trying to do. They give people uh, uh, meaning and uh, they encourage them toward uh, good character and good deeds. I, I find them all fascinating. I respect just about all of them. And uh, I just feel like Joseph Campbell once said, I kind of know too much to really believe in any one of them, but my attitude toward them is one of positive fascination. So I'm sorry for that sermonette, uh, but uh, it, it, to me, it's it's like a consuming mystery, and uh, I love it. So, um, 
Oh boy, I tell you, I just can't shut up, can I? Um, <laughs> uh, Chester Malloy was the Jesus movement a relic of the revolution of Judas Maccabeus, or perhaps a twisted memory of it? Well, uh, possibly, but there were other rebels. Uh, even in the time of the um, of the Roman domination, and it's uh, not unlikely that, as Brandon and Heisler and uh, Rymaris said, that Jesus was a revolutionary. There are little bits of what look like loose ends in an otherwise whitewashed story of Jesus. Uh, the what was the insurrection in which Barabbas killed a Roman? What was Jesus really doing in the temple? And uh, how could he have done whatever it was in an area, the court of the Gentiles, that was large as, as large as several football fields, which the gospel doesn't tell you, but Josephus did. There, there are all kinds of, why did he have disciples named so-and-so the zealot, so-and-so the Sicarius dagger, uh, so-and-so the bar Jonah, the, the terrorist? What the heck? Uh, what's going on here? Why did Jesus tell uh, his disciples to sell the shirt off their back if they didn't have a sword? Because they're going to need it. <laughs> There's some strange goings on here. They kind of make it look like Jesus might have been somebody like Judas of Galilee or Judah Maccabee or something. Uh, I mean, it, who knows, though? There have been several books where people say, I bet you that Jesus' character is based on Judas of Galilee. Well, uh, my pal Ralph Ellis says he thinks several of these various uh, rebels and, and would-be kings or actual kings were the historical Jesus that the memory of him has been shattered and, and uh, distributed abroad. Uh, and so that you have traces of Jesus where you might not expect them, which is kind of what you're saying, I think. Uh, so uh, I'm continuing to look into that, and I have a lot more sympathy for the Jesus the Zealot view than I used to. But again, tough to prove one way or the other. Ah, let's see. Uh, Z. Stallone. Have, wait, let me get the glasses here. Uh, have you noticed that Paul's conversion uh, is from a uh, Bacchus Dionysus uh, story, I guess? Did Luke rip it off and why? And is it possible that Paul's conversion story was used with Constantine as well for his dream vision? Uh, well, I uh, do think that the book of Acts, with the story of Paul's conversion and his imprisonment in Philippi and so on, I do think all of that is based on Euripides the Bacchae, where Paul is cast in the role of Dionysus, who is uh, the son of God incarnate, masquerading as his own apostle, evangelizing uh, for himself. Uh, I think that is, is very clear. And Dennis McDonald has shown that uh, a good bit of the Gospel of John looks like it came from uh, the Bacchae. A great play. You ought to read it if you haven't already. Probably have. Uh, and um, I think also, and this was around centuries before Luke, and as an educated writer, he must have known about it, everybody else did. Similarly, 2 Maccabees chapter 3 has a similar story about a persecuting agent of a king um, being turned around despite himself and converted uh, to uh, Judaism after a, a, an abortive assault on the temple where he was going to rob the treasury and bring the money back to his king. Uh, and it sounds so much like uh, Acts chapter 9. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, speaking of Ralph Ellis, he, he's pointed out like a dozen or more striking parallels between Paul's biography in Acts and Josephus's autobiography. That leads him to think that 
the historical Paul was Josephus, I take it a little differently. I think that uh, probably Luke has, uh, he seems to have been familiar with um, with uh, Josephus's writings and uh, that he borrowed all of that stuff and attributed it to Paul. So do we know much about Paul? Uh, I think all of that is an attempt to give him alternate identity, whereas originally he was Simon Magus. Uh, but that's another whole, uh, whole can of worms. You got one. Okay. Yeah, I got one here. Um, this guy says, uh, hi, my name is also Bob, formerly mm. Pastor Bob of an Assembly of God Church. Mm. I recently got remarried and they let me go because they said that I was living in adultery because I had gotten divorced 20 years earlier, uh, not due to any infidelities mm. on either part. But uh, what do you think about that? And do you think the Bible condemns my marriage? I don't think so. By the way, my friend Bob Siegel, who I've debated a couple of times, a fellow Star Trek fan, fellow writer and great guy, um, he had the same thing happen. He didn't want to get divorced, but it became inevitable. And so he got kicked out of uh, some uh, church office, though he's, he's still a pastor now. And uh, But the same thing happened. And now that depends on whether you think Jesus was outlawing divorce. Uh, and uh, it's understandable that some think he was because the question is posed to him not as a trap, but but it was a debated question in the day. Uh, uh, the House of Hillel, those rabbis a, a century earlier said, yeah, since, since Deuteronomy says that a man can send his wife away for any uh, uh, difficulty, it's very vague. Uh, and, it can, and Hillel said, well, let's show how vague it is. Uh, a guy could divorce his wife if she just was a lousy cook. Uh, and and he, he pointedly was trying to come up with a trivial offense to say, yeah, uh, it's wide open. But the House of Shammai, more conservative Pharisees, said, no, no, it, it's got to be unfair. It's got to be infidelity. Uh, and Matthew it reintroduces the same ambiguity. Uh, Mark said, um, well, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm jumping the gun. Jesus is asked, well, what do you think about it? And he says, well, what did Moses say? Uh, and he knows, of course, and the, the Pharisees say, well, Moses said in Deuteronomy, if a man wants to divorce his wife, let him write, or write a significant <laughs> certificate of divorce. And Jesus says, yes, of course. Uh, but what about uh, in uh, Genesis, when it says that for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. And what God has joined together, let no mere mortal separate. Well, that's the will of God. Yes, he commanded what you said about divorce in Deuteronomy, but what does that tell you? This wasn't his ideal plan. It was a concession to the hardness of the human heart. Does Jesus then say that, no, nah, I'm afraid you can't do it. I mean, he even says that if, if a man divorces his wife and marries another woman, uh, He's an adulterer because in God's eyes, he's still married to the first one. And if his ex-wife remarries, she's an adulteress too, because she's still in God's eyes married to the guy that kicked her out. But what are you going to do? Jesus doesn't seem to think that the human heart is softened. So I think it's like uh, one of these lesser evil things because he would have said otherwise if that's what he meant. So I think that uh, people that have done this, you know, they're, they're up they're between a rock and a hard place. You're going to stay in an intolerable situation or suppose the woman leaves the man because the bastard's beating her. She, she, does she have to stay and take that? No, uh, I mean technically, maybe uh, it's there's they're separating a marriage made in heaven. But come on, 
you know, let's not be legalistic. It seems to me that that's the point of what Jesus says in, in the Gospels. And uh, so that I don't think the guy's got anything to, to worry about. Uh, it's just unfortunate that he's uh, uh, up against people that take a more legalistic view. I can understand why they do, but I think he's right. So he can always quote the Bible, Geek. Of course, that'll sink his argument immediately, but uh, I, I think he's he's correct. Ooh, yeah, good, good question. Um, Christopher Malloy, are you familiar with Lena Einhorn's theory uh, on Jesus being the Egyptian uh, and also uh, Saul slash Paul actually being the Egyptian and by the same token being Jesus? Uh, thoughts? Well, uh, I uh, have a harder time with the idea that uh, Saul slash Paul and Jesus were the same guy. Though even that is not out of the question, um, but uh, I mean, you got weird sayings in the in Galatians, like "I bear on my body uh, the marks of Christ," the stigmata or something. Uh, uh, it, when you um, uh, when I came to you, I was in distress, but you received me as uh, as an angel of God, even as Christ Himself. Is it possible uh, what she says there? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, weirder things have happened. But as, as F.C. Bauer said, the historian wants to know what not what is possible, but what is probable. So I kind of abstain on that one. Now, the Egyptian, you know, who that is, right, in Acts, uh, Paul is about to get flogged. And uh, they say, and the guy interrogating him says, "Aren't you that Egyptian that led a whole bunch of the Sicarii, the rebel assassins, out into the wilderness? Uh, because this this guy escaped. His followers were all killed, but he managed to get away. So, uh, is that you? Are you resurfacing here? And uh, he doesn't say that he wasn't, but he says, "Hey, are you allowed to?" whip Roman citizens because I am one. What? Uh, okay, guys, we don't want to get in trouble here. If this guy is a, technically a citizen, uh, then, you know, we, we don't have any right to uh, to lash him. Uh, I mean, you know, nothing's been proven and all that. And he says, and Paul says, yeah, I, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Roman says, I, I had to pay big money for my citizenship. You know, you weren't automatically a citizen uh, there. And uh, Paul says, well, not me. I, I inherited it. My father was a citizen, however he became one. And so uh, there's this hint that he might have been this guy. And Josephus does mention the unnamed Egyptian who was a prophet or a would-be messiah. Uh, and, uh, and the same story, basically. And um, could Paul have been this person? Could Jesus have been this person? Because as Lena says, I, I'm fortunate to know her. I don't mean to name drop. As she says that, uh, uh, yeah, these stories where, you know, Jesus says in the synoptic apocalypse, uh, if they say to you, look, here he is uh, out in the wilderness, don't go out there. Well, that's what the Egyptian did. Hey, meet me in the wilderness and we'll march on Jerusalem and so on. That's interesting. And then Jesus himself is like feeding the multitude in the wilderness. Now, is this, this just the kind of thing these characters did? Or could he have been identified with one of these? Well, my favorite theory, and that's how I'm putting it, because you cannot demonstrate any of these. But I find the, the one most attractive, because it fits into a larger theory I have, that, the, that Simon Magus, who was the same as Paul, was the Egyptian. Because um, the pseudo-Clementines tell us that Simon was the um, was the chief disciple of John the Baptist and would have been his successor when John was beheaded. But when that happened, he was away uh, learning more uh, magic tricks. Where? In Egypt. 
and then he came back and fought Docythius, who would become the leader in the meantime, beat him, and became the head of the sect, at least for a while. And uh, he apparently was a messianic character. And so I kind of wonder if um, when he escaped from the slaughter of his, uh, his followers, if uh, the uh, Roman procurator, Felix or Festus, whichever one it was, uh, captured him. Mean, it was sort of like Herod Antipas and John the Baptist. He was intrigued by this guy. Uh, and uh, then he said, look, I'll, uh, I'll go easy on you if you will become my court astrologer and magician. And I said, well, okay. Uh, so I have a sneak and hunch the Egyptians survived to become Simon Magus, who Josephus tells us was a member of the entourage of the Roman procurator. Who knows, right? But uh, some, some scholars have said they think Simon Magus was uh, the Egyptian. So good enough for me, hallelujah. Um, oh, let's see. Boy, we got a bunch of good ones tonight. Uh, hallelujah. Um, crossover maniac says, uh, what pantheon did Yahweh belong to before monotheism and what role did he play in that pantheon? Well, he was pretty much the same as Baal, who was also called Yahweh, uh, the son of El, just like Yahweh was the son of El Elyon. Uh, and uh, he was eventually fused with Elyon, as, as you see, even in the Garden of Eden, where uh, chapter two and three, where uh, God is called, excuse me, Yahweh Elohim, uh, the two have been fused together. Or in Genesis 14, after the defeat of the king of Sodom, also the inventor of Swiss of, of cheese, right? Because his name was Cheddar Lamb, or I'm kidding. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, and uh, uh, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, comes out and uh, offers him sacramental bread and wine, whereupon Abraham uh, makes an offering to him as a priest king. And he says, uh, Melchizedek says, Blessed be Abraham by El Elyon maker of heaven and earth. And um, Abraham in return says, blessed be Melchizedek by Yahweh El Elyon. The gods are fused together. And then we start hearing how Baal, who was a warrior god and a storm god, just like Yahweh, uh, he uh, is suddenly known as Elyon Baal. So did they fuse them together too? So uh, he was the, uh, the heir apparent, and um, you have uh, in Daniel 7 an old creation account sort of wedged in there and made a political allegory where uh, the, the dragons of the deep come up one by one, and one like a son of man banishes all four of them, and then... Uh, rides on the clouds, which Baal and Yahweh both did, to the throne of, of uh, the Ancient of Days, Elyon, uh, who was too old and infirm to fight the dragons himself. It's just like Babylonian mythology with Marduk and, and Ea and all these guys, right? Same story, uh, different names. And he becomes the ruler at the right hand of Elyon, and uh, then eventually they're, they're merged. Um, so, yeah, he was part of the same religion that several of the Canaanites had and that the uh, Babylonians and Assyrians had under different names. They just uh, had basically the same set of myths and rituals. Uh, so it was just a sort of standard brand ancient Middle Eastern religion. So... Um, Z. <laughs> uh, Stallone, was Cain a vegetarian? Why was Cain so against animal sacrifice? Why did God favor Abel? And is it possible they were rival gods like Yahweh and Baal? Well, in fact, one theory is that Abel is another version of Baal. 
who was also known simply as Bell. Uh, and uh, so Abel uh, may have been uh, God, the god Baal. And uh, in there, there's some kind of hint. I remember reading this in uh, Graves and Patai's great book, um, Hebrew Myths, the book of Genesis, where there's some evidence, some reason to think that uh, Abel was believed to have risen from the dead like Baal and that his blood fertilized the ground and so on. Um, well, was Cain a vegetarian? Well, we don't really know. It's just that he was like the father of agriculturalists. So when he was going to offer something to God, he offered the best he had, the first fruits of his crop. Whereas uh, Abel was a shepherd, the, the guy that invented that. They're both culture heroes, right? And so uh, as a shepherd, he's going to offer the first fruits of his flock. So each offered what they had. It's not clear why uh, Cain's offering is rejected. Uh, I My guess is it's because somewhere along the line, this was uh, anti-Canaanite propaganda because the Canaanite um, religion was an ag a system of agricultural fertility magic. That's why they had uh, the the sacred prostitutes or Kodeshim, or as I like to call them, the priestitutes, uh, because um, the idea was they were the priests, priestesses of uh, Astarte and Baal, uh, the divine couple. And when they would have sex with Farmer Brown, and that was the ritual, uh, the reason for that was it, it was like imitative magic that um, the priestitute was taking the role of Mother Earth and uh, Farmer Brown was in the role of Baal fertilizing the earth so that he would have better crops that year. Uh, and the semen of Baal and the semen of the farmer and the rain were symbolically the same thing. Uh, so um, uh, they didn't like the agriculture. And there were people like Jeremiah and like the uh, the Rechabites who were very much like the, the Muslim Wahhabis of Saudi Arabia that said, hey, we don't want to corrupt our faith with those uh, those decadent farmers' religions. They were desert Puritans. They said, when, when our ancestors worshipped God in the austerity of the desert, that was real piety. Uh, we're not going to give in to the allurements of uh, this corrupting prosperity of the farmers. And so it got a bad rap. And Cain, I think, in this story represents the Canaanites. Uh, and it's a way of saying, Yahweh doesn't like that stuff. He, he doesn't approve of that kind of worship uh, of, the, of Canaan, even though it had been the religion of the, the Hebrews themselves. They were Canaanites. No, no, no. Uh, he likes the desert austerity presumably of some of the tribes who federated into Israel. So I think that's probably what's going on there. Uh, not for long asks, is the plural form Elohim in the Old Testament the unjust God and Yahweh the just God? Elohim desires animal sacrifice and Yahweh desires obedience, not sacrifice. It's possible, and Philo said something like that. He said uh, the two cherubim, the, the winged figures on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, stood for two aspects of Yahweh. Uh, one was Yahweh, one was Elohim, but there were two aspects, to two poles of the same God. One was uh, that of justice, the other of mercy, both characteristics of God. Uh, sometimes one was more dominant, sometimes the other. Uh, but um, I don't know if such a distinction is drawn in the Old Testament. Uh, I've never studied it from that standpoint. It might be, but then Yahweh is uh, the one to whom sa animal sacrifice is often mandated uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, so I'm not sure. That's, that's a good question. 
and uh, well worth looking into. Yeah, let's see. Uh, let's see here. Christopher Malloy says, Abel, A, Bell, equals without cattle. No, I do not know. I could be, I don't know Hebrew. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, uh, Jonathan Gandy says that's a good alpha privative, like atheist, no godist, or agnostic, we don't know, uh, and so on. Hmm, interesting, interesting. I'll tell you, these Bible geeks are really something. I am impressed. Uh, why, uh, Tony G, why did Jesus tell his disciples they would see the Son of Man coming in the clouds instead of, uh, you'll see me coming in the clouds? Uh, I think that's because in those passages in the Gospels about the Son of Man coming, like uh, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? He may not have been referring to himself. Like he, he may be like the like John the Baptist saying, when the coming one arrives, uh, he's going to baptize you uh, in, in the spirit and in fire. I'm just baptizing you in water. Well, he's not the coming one. Uh, he, he's saying that this is a, a successor who is greater than me. And um, Boltman and others have said, yeah, that's probably, if these are authentic sayings of Jesus, he's probably talking about somebody else, but that um, Christians after Jesus' death uh, said, you know, I bet he has been made the, the, uh, the son of man in Daniel who will come in judgment. I mean, he may not have, have thought it, but I bet he is. He's been glorified and exalted to that position at the right hand of God. And I tell you, one thing that makes that plausible is uh, what happened with uh, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, uh, who was the uh, the great uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe, right? He uh, was saying, you got to repent and be ready for the coming of the Messiah. And he was very charismatic. A uh, teacher of mine once met him and said, yeah, this guy was really something. And I wish I had met him. And uh, when he died shortly thereafter, oh yeah, his followers began to say, I, I can't help thinking that the Rebbe is the Messiah. He just won't say it, but he doesn't really need to. But then he died. And so they began to say, well, he'll be back. Uh, he is the Messiah. Some of them even quickly began to say, he was really God incarnate. A very surprising thing for pious Jews to say. Uh, so it may, uh, that's very much like Bultmann decades before had suggested about these coming of the Son of Man sayings. Uh, there, there are other uses for the phrase Son of Man in the Gospels. Like when Jesus is talking about his coming trials and death, he, he uses Son of Man in a kind of euphemistic way as if to ward off the impending doom. That was common in the day. You you wouldn't say, well, boy, I'm going in for a dangerous operation. It's like if you said that, you, you're bringing it on somehow, a superstition, basically. And so you would say, well, uh, someone is going in uh, for a dangerous operation. You mean yourself. Well, the idiom was uh, the son of man is going in there. Uh, if... Um, or if you were trying to say, trying to defend yourself by appealing to the lot of humanity in general, or the privileges of the of humanity in general, uh, you might speak of the Son of Man, uh, as when Jesus says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, or uh, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth as, as God forgives them in heaven. Uh, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. The human beings have no natural habitat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and I, uh, I remember watching Donahue decades ago. I don't know if you remember him, but uh, he had a Hasidic uh, gent on the show, and he 
ask him this embarrassing question. He said, I heard that uh, Hasidic Jews, when they have sex, uh, have a sheet between them concealing one another, but with a hole cut in it through which they can have sex. Is that true? And the guy said, it is a shame for the son of man. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, it is a shame to humanity. And uh, Donahue ignorantly apparently thought he's saying, oh, no, that would be disgusting and perverse. But that ain't what he was saying. Right? He says, how dare you embarrass me uh, by uh, bringing up such a thing? I mean, I don't want to implicate myself in this because you think it's funny. So he says, that's a shame to humanity, the son of man. So it's, it's still used, basically. Uh, but it, when you have a saying about the coming of the son of man, that's Daniel 7. He's talking about the, the great judge at the end of the age, uh, which he may or may not have thought was himself. But after, after the crucifixion, they said, yeah, I, I think it's him. Um, let's see, uh, crossover maniac. If oh, this is a, a nice, uh, um, uh, what the heck is it? A uh, super chat. Thank you. Uh, if adultery was a capital offense, then how could it be a reason for divorce since the adulterers were stoned and the offended party became a widow? You got me. That is an excellent question. But supposedly, uh, it was a capital offense. I, I don't know. Maybe uh, it was just that, uh, you know, how in uh, go the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph finds that his fiancée, Mary, is pregnant. And he figures, well, she was either raped or she's fooling around. But in either case, the law tells me I cannot marry her. Uh, so, but I, I love her. I, uh, I can forgive her, but I can't marry her, but I don't want to expose her to public scandal. So I will separate from her, cancel the engagement, but on the quiet, uh, maybe that's what, uh, they did. Maybe the, um, the, uh, sinned against husband, uh, would say, uh, I, I don't want to see her dead, uh, but I, I can't marry her. I'll just, you know, try to be forgiving enough to save her life. I don't know. That's an excellent point, but I would assume it had to be something like that. Yeah, very good question. Boy, I am pleased at these, these geeks. Hmm, I think I've skipped some. Um, King Vegetarian. Oh, let's see. Uh, Jonathan Gandhi says, might you speak on who the first liar of the Bible was? Uh, well, uh, if you're going according to the implied chronology of the stories, it's God, right? Um, now, stay away from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because in the day you eat of it, you will die. And then the serpent comes along and says, I see you're not eating of that tree. Anything wrong with it? And he says, oh, yes, uh, Eve says. Uh, God has told us we can eat from any of the other trees, but not this one, because if we eat, it will drop dead. And the serpent says, that's not true. You're not going to die. I'll tell you what will happen, though. Your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, well, then when she saw that it was good for food, it wouldn't poison her. And it had the added benefit of making one wise. She took of it, took a bite and gave some to her husband who was with her. And the eyes of both were opened. And then Yahweh says to his fellow deities, look at this, they've become like us, knowing good and evil. We got to get them out of here before they eat from the tree of life and live forever. We don't want the competition. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the first liar is Jehovah himself. Uh, he is trying to protect the, uh, the prerogatives of himself and his fellow deities. This may be the greatest blasphemy 
Uh, why is it that people do not see what it plainly says? The narrator, who you kind of have to believe because it's his story, and Yahweh admit that it, what, what Yahweh said wasn't true. Uh, it, it's like the Prometheus story. It's really kind of another version of it. Hmm. See, um, here's one uh, from Man Bear Pig. Oh, wait a minute. Is this, this looks like a part two of something. Let's see if I can find the rest of it. Um, mm, Man Bear Pig, where are you? Oh, man. Oh, well, uh, I can't find that, but I'll get back to the um, as much of the question as I do have. Um, this is from Constellation Pegasus, a generous fellow. Thank you for the 1999 uh, uh, Super Chat. Rabbinic writings say the Tower of Babel was built to pierce the vault to see if it was made of clay, stone, or copper. That's the firmament, of course. Uh, more proof that the flat earth and the dome cosmology is taught in Genesis. Oh yeah, unquestionably. Uh, there, it, it, it describes, as, as all the ancients we know of thought do, that there is a solid dome because rakia, the, uh, the Hebrew word for firmament, firmament, uh, means a dome beaten out of metal plates. Uh, and it's over the flat earth which is over, floating upon the, the, the Tahom, the ocean depth, out of which the dry land emerged, right? And um, uh, let's see, uh, and then there, uh, why is there the dome over it? An astrodome, you might say. Well, that's because there is an outer space ocean above, because that's where the rain comes from. There are windows in the firmament, and that's why rain falls. The, there is the ocean beneath, because that's why water comes up through wells. Uh, and the dome has lights installed in it, small ones, the, uh, the sun, the moon, the stars. One of the ancient Greek natural philosophers said that he thought the, he, he calculated that the sun must be gigantic, possibly 10 miles in diameter. He got laughed off stage. Nobody could believe it. Oh, um, he was being uh, pretty generous there. Uh, and uh, yeah, and there were pillars of the earth. They held up the, the uh, firmament. And uh, the temple was like a microcosm of the of the universe. And Boaz and Jacob, the two great pillars uh, in the temple, they stand for the pillars of the uh, uh, holding up the firmament and so on. Oh, it's so fascinating. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so you, you're certainly right. And it, it, the Egyptians and various others had different versions of the same darn thing. Mm hmm. Z Stallone, is it possible that Amen or Amen comes from Amun Ra? What are the origins of the word Amen? Uh, nobody knows, as far as I um, uh, know. Uh, it's been theorized that it does come from the Egyptian god Amen, like Amun Ra or Amon Ra, uh, because there were no vowels in ancient Egyptian, just like in ancient Hebrew and cognate languages. Um, it might, but uh, nobody really knows for sure. Uh, I, I would imagine it's probably the, the theory with the most in favor uh, of it, but uh, who knows exactly. Um, uh, uh, Nick Ross says, uh, I don't just learn, I guess, from the show. I'm thoroughly entertained, laugh out loud, funny, and brilliant. Well, I'm glad uh, you, you 
that's what I intend. So I'm glad it works that way. Ooh, oh, uh, Man Bear Pig points out that Yahweh hardens Pharaoh's heart in the P source, the priestly source. In the J source, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. Oh, yes, I had forgotten about that. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, boy, this is, uh, there's a lot of stuff here. I just want to make sure I didn't, uh, skip stuff. Okay, uh, three things fishing. Why is Mary, a mother of Jesus, so revered in Catholicism? I was raised Protestant and she barely got a passing mention. Yeah, you know, the, the founders of Protestantism were big Mary fans. They believed in the perpetual vir uh, virginity of Mary and the Immaculate Conception of Mary and um, I guess the Assumption of Mary into heaven. And uh, it was a way of honoring Jesus, like the, the whole Nestorian controversy way back in the fifth century was about this. Nestorius, the bishop, heard his uh, some of his uh, uh, parishioners uh, singing praises to Mary as the Theotokos, the God-bearer or mother of God. And he said, what? You're making Mary into a goddess. You can't do that. And their response was, well, no, we're not. What we're saying is that her son, Jesus, though a human being, was also God. So we're saying that even as an infant, even as a zygote, Jesus was God as well as man. And Nestorius thought that was grotesque. Uh, but, you know, again, there's a pretty good answer to it. Well, uh, do you think it's equally grotesque to say that in Jesus, God died on the cross? I mean, if that's a stumbling block to you, I, what are you doing being a bishop in the Christian religion? Same thing here. Uh, there was a controversial French movie some few decades ago uh, called, uh, oh man, what was it? Hail Mary or something like that, uh, where it placed uh, the nativity in modern times. What would it look like if these events of the nativity um, happened then? And so um, there's one scene where Joseph just can't stand it anymore, and he starts making a move on Mary, and the angel Gabriel appears and pushes him away. You got no business here, buddy. And uh, and then later, after she uh, bears Jesus, and he's uh, well, a few years old, they're packing the car to go out in the country for a picnic, and uh, the young Jesus just comes out with a statement, I am he who is. And Joseph says, get in the car. I, I, I love that because that's kind of the whole Nestorius thing right in, in, a, in a cameo, you might say. But I think that was the point. You're trying to say something about Jesus, not Mary. But inevitably, once you're praising her as, as sinless and all that, because wait a minute, wait a minute. She must have been immaculately conceived because she couldn't have passed on sin, original sin, to Jesus. So how would that be? Well, God must have, you know, intervened there. So she was immaculately conceived, and from there on in, she get, she rises higher and higher. Uh, more and more uh, divine attributes are uh, are accorded to her until uh, Protestants finally say, "Wait, wait a second. Are we talking about a human being anymore? Uh, you, you're making her into a goddess. It was the same sort of thing. I mean, when you start saying Mary was somehow, and I don't even know how they rationalize this, was the co-creatrix. Mary was on the team, the engineering core, when they made the, the world. <laughs> I, I don't get that. Uh, or Mary was the co-redemptrix that her, her suffering at the, the miserable treatment accorded her son availed for the salvation of the human race along with the suffering of Jesus. Ooh, boy, I don't have enough vestigial Protestantism left in me to think yeah, that's problematic. Uh, you mean there were two saviors? Uh, I don't know if you really want to say that, do you? Uh, and uh, so Protestants eventually 
affected by it. Okay, um, let's go back down and see if I missed any more. Hmm. Ah, Pharaoh. Um. Oh, amen. Uh, Rabbinic Writings, Tower of Babel. Oh, Pete Rabbit says I may have missed one of his at the beginning. I don't want to. No, uh, I did that one. Hmm. Who we got here? Pharaoh's free will. Ooh. Uh, amen. Tower of Babel. Solomon, uh, someone uh, in the Bible seems to co-opt a lot of Om Omri's exploits. Solomon, sorry, of the Bible seems to co-opt a lot of Omri's exploits, according to Finkelstein. Uh, we're going to have him on uh, one of the shows here, uh, an interview uh, that... Uh, Bishop Taylor and I are going to do, and uh, Israel Finkelstein will be on there. I'll have to ask him about that. Mm. Ah. Oh. Hit the like button, everyone, and spread the word that Robert M. Price is back. Thank you. Um. Boy, we did a lot of them. Uh, let's see. Lena Einhorn. Uh, boy, that's a lot of them, right? Canaanite Pantheon. Um, uh, Man Bear Pig says, uh, uh, that an origin for Yahweh out of Midian or further south in Arabian in the uh, Arabian theor uh, Arabian Peninsula theories make more sense to me than uh, him being a Canaanite god. Well, uh, actually, uh, he is said to encounter Yahweh in the burning bush in Midian. Right that. His uh, father-in-law, Jethro, is the priest of Midian because the holy mountain, Horeb slash Sinai, happens to fall in his allotted territory. Uh, he's the high priest of Yahweh because of that a kind of a chance thing that he's in charge of this. And uh, it's in Midian, and when and th this is called the Kenite hypothesis. The Kenites were Midianites, and so there's, the scholars have said, wait a minute, you know, uh, Moses asks God in the burning bush, who shall I say sent me to redeem the people in Israel? And he says, I am that I am. Tell them that I am sent you. Tell them that Yahweh sent you. Uh, and uh, did he know of this God before? I mean, he was raised as an Egyptian. Uh, so, uh, so the theory is, yeah, he is uh, now meeting the, the uh, Midianite God. Uh, there's also various statements about how God left um, Mount Seir, or how you say it, S-E-I-R, which was, I think, in Edom. Uh, so any way you cut it, it's all in that Canaanite neighborhood, and all these groups would, would be uh, classified as, as different Canaanites. They just had little postage stamp countries, really. <sighs> Excuse me. Um. <laughs> Cain, vegetarian, adultery, capital offense... Son of man seen in the clouds. 
Uh, okay, uh, cross of Romaniac. It would be ironic if Jesus was referring to Vespasian as the son of man. I know Joseph Atwill would probably think that's who Jesus is referring to. Yeah, you know, I used to think that was a wacky theory, but I, I'm thinking that it, I differ with Joe on a bunch of things there, but I think he may be right about that. Uh, that it's not absolutely clear, if you look at it closely, that, that the synoptic apocalypse, when it talks about the coming of the Son of Man, means Jesus is predicting his own return. Uh, if that's a good way of reading it, but it seems like uh, kind of references are kind of iffy and sparse there. When he says people will come in my name saying, I am he, does that mean people will say, I predicted somebody saying in my name? Oh, yeah, Jesus said this and uh, that they'll be wrong. But finally, the um, the son of man predicted in Daniel will come and uh, and destroy the temple. Well, who did that? It was Vespasian. Right, uh, the son of God, uh, Titus or Vespasian, uh, both were called both. Actually, the both had the long name, including both of those, and uh, and and it, it's it seems to me that the way apocalypses are always putting events in the past from the standpoint of the writer, uh, as if they were future predictions that uh, he almost has to mean Titus and or Vespasian. So I think maybe uh, Joe is right about that. Okay. Um, Christopher Malloy, do you know how the Ethiopian church transitioned from something like the first temple theology straight to Christianity? I don't know enough about it to say that. I do know that even today, uh, missionary churches in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, find the Old Testament more to their liking than the New in some ways because their their uh, society and agriculture, etc., are more like that of ancient Israel than in, like the Hellenistic world. Uh, but I'm not sure what that has to do with the, the shape and form of uh, their their church life. Uh, so I, I wish I knew more about that, uh, Christopher. I, I can't really be sure what the deal is there. Hmm, see. Uh, Jesus, boy, this is tiny. Right. Jesus said, take heed, let no one fool you, claiming I am Christ. Maybe he didn't consider himself the Messiah. Bingo, could well be. Right. Um, what was it about a Jew that made Luther want to rip it out of the Bible? I uh, am not sure, but my guess would be the quote from Enoch. Uh, that, uh, that that creates a problem for fundamentalists even today because they're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, he's quoting a non-canonical book plainly as if it were scripture. Does that mean we ought to have the have first Enoch in the Bible? Well, uh, Tertullian thought so, uh, and some others did. Uh, I'm guessing that was the problem. And... Uh, because I, I don't know what else is in there is supposed to be objectionable. Uh, and uh, so I, I think that's prob Oh, and similarly, the business about uh, from the, uh, the lost uh, book, um, The Assumption of Moses, which Origen tells us a little about, where it says that uh, um, Michael and Satan were arguing over who gets the remains of Moses. Uh, Satan, no doubt, saying, hey, this guy was shut out from the promised land. He was a sinner. He's mine. And Gabriel says, no, nah, no, nah, that was just a minor infraction. And it must have ended with uh, Gabriel winning the um, the argument and Moses ascending to heaven. But we don't know. I mean, uh, I'm guessing that's it. And I, I would think that's what bothered Luther. You mean I have to believe that? 
It's like Catholics being stuck with believing Mary ascended bodily into heaven. Oh no, please no. Uh, when, when the Pope in the 50s said that, yeah, that happened all right, that's Catholic dogma, a lot of Catholic scholars said, oh man, what a headache. I, I can't, uh, well, I guess I'll have to go along with that. So um, Luther must have figured, well, I don't if I don't accept this as scripture. So sayonara Jude. Or hey Jude, right? Anyway, well, I think that's it. I oh, oh oh no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, okay, Christopher Malloy. Do you think it's possible Jesus was an actual king like Ralph Ellis does? I, I'm inclined to think not. But I just don't know enough about his theory yet. There's an awful lot of his work I, I've not yet read. So I tentatively, I'm a bit skeptical, but I'm open. You know, I, I, my policy is when I hear something that really makes me think, what? I, I got to look into it because uh, Ralph is no dummy. Uh, he he uh, is a, an incredible historian. He's like omniscient on all sorts of things, so it deserves a look. Uh, plus, even if he isn't right, but Brandon Eisler and uh, and others were right, Jesus was a was the man who would be king. It was crucified as the failed king of the Jews. That's if that's true. That's not all that far from what Ralph is saying. Uh, but uh, again, I don't know enough about it to say. But uh, I, I uh, respect Ralph's work enough to know I got to check it out further. Hmm. What my, okay, my dog Rex uh, says, what might take place when the age of Pisces, that is Jesus slash fish, ends in the age of Aquarius? Water begins. A major change in the alleged gods? You got me. I, I, I don't know. You know, I, I tend not to take astrology seriously, but it's pretty obvious some of the biblical writers did. So, you know, if you want to know what the Bible might have to say about this, uh, it's worth looking into. I don't happen to know, though. Um, I did a sermon once called The Equinox of the Gods, uh, where I talked about how in Esther, uh, at the base of that is an old story about how the Elamite gods uh, were replaced by um, the Babylonian gods, and that Esther, well, let's see, uh, that uh, that Vashti, the the first king of Ahasuerus, Artaxerxes, uh, she was Mashti, an Elamite goddess. Uh, that um, and then uh, when then she is. Uh, she is then replaced by Esther, whose name is another version of Ishtar, a Babylonian goddess. Then uh, you got um, Haman. Uh, he was a persecutor of Jews. He was originally Human, an Elamite god, and is replaced by Haman. And then he is replaced by Mordecai, whose name is simply a different spelling of Marduk, uh, and so forth. And I said, is this kind of what is happening when Jesus assaults the Jerusalem temple? Is he replacing Yahweh in some fashion? The equinox of the gods, to steal a line from Aleister Crowley. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, that would really be interesting to hear from a, a, a biblical astrotheological expert like my great uh, friend uh, Acharya S, but there are other people who are still around, uh, sadly she is not, uh, who might answer that question. I, I'd love to know what somebody <laughs> adept in that field would say. Um, uh, Tony G says, how is it determined uh, that the serpent was the bad guy and God was the good guy? Well, I think the, the story of the Garden of Eden is a subversive one written by a Levitical priest 
who was demoted, um, as Ezekiel says, because he had been a priest of one of the gods ejected in the, the Deuteronomic reform. He had been, uh, we're told that Josiah uh, had uh, ejected Nehushtan, the serpent god, threw out the bronze serpent that was an image of him. And uh, so that, um, and, and those who were priests of this and other gods were demoted. They were still allowed to be priests or at least flunkies, priestly assistants, sextons and things like that. Uh, but they couldn't worship their gods any longer. Well, I just would bet shekels on this that the uh, Eden story was written by a, a defrocked priest of Nehushtan. And uh, he wanted to, he couldn't openly say, I still believe in Nehushtan, not Yahweh. I mean, Yahweh exists, but he's a tyrant. Uh, I'm, I'm for Nehushtan, just like in ancient Greece. Um, Prometheus was a god. He was one of the previous pantheon, the Titans, and he was the cousin of Zeus, the king of the Olympian dynasty. And uh, so they were both around, but Zeus was the chief. And he wasn't that uh, concerned about the humans that he had created. So Prometheus said, these people need help and I'm going to give it to them. They taught them the use of fire and so on. He paid for it big time. Well, in the same way, this priest who wrote the uh, the Eden story is thinking that uh, that uh, Jehovah is not very nice to his creatures. Uh, and he doesn't seem to care that much about them, something a lot of readers would say today. Uh, and so uh, I am going to uh, do something about this. He's keeping them in the dark. He wants to keep them ignorant. Well, I got to do something about that. I'm going to tell him the truth. Uh, and I'm going to have my God, Nehushtan and the serpent, tell him the truth. At least somebody stick it up for them. And so they uh, they get knowledge thanks to the Promethean serpent. And uh, then God says, hey, what's going on here? I told you not to eat of that. Oh, my gosh. Get the heck out of here. Uh, and he punishes the man, the woman, and the snake, Nehushtan. It's another version of the combat myth where Yahweh defeats Leviathan. It's sort of demythologized partly, but it's made into a Prometheus uh, parallel. And, uh, and But um, somebody didn't see that. I mean, almost nobody has seen it in all these thousands of years. The ancient Gnostics did. Uh, they understood it. They just read it literally that God, is, Jehovah, is lying and the serpent is telling the truth. There were Gnostics called the Naasenes, which meant the Nehushtan, the serpent worshippers. Uh, presumably, they carried on this tradition underground. And uh, but the 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 um, official, you know, canonical Jewish faith, they said, "Oh no, Yahweh is the good guy. The serpent must have been trying to seduce them." Though it plainly says the opposite. But just like today's Bible readers, they cannot imagine that the God, Jehovah, that they have been catechized to believe is the ultimate good uh, God uh, could be the liar. So they just do not see it on the page. They may be a little confused, but eh, we'll wait till we get to heaven to find that out. But that's why I think it's just catechism. Uh, the home team is the Jehovah team, right? So we've got to think he was the good guy. Oh, mm. Asherite alchemist says originally the serpent was a guardian and servant of the god or goddess. Yeah, even Philo makes a mysterious comment saying that the Edenic serpent was named Eve. Uh, Eve was, of course, originally a goddess, the mother of all living. She was also known as Hebe or Heba, one of the wives of Hercules. And she was pretty much the same as Sibylle, uh, the, the mountain uh, goddess of Phrygia. 
Uh, so yeah, she's she's been demoted to a uh, a primordial Lucy Ricardo, basically. Um, uh, Mary equals Ashera, the wife of El, the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Take a look at uh, Margaret Barker's great book, The Great Angel: A Study of Israel's Second God. What a shocker. Um, Christopher Malloy, do you think the Babylonians cooked up Moses from what they knew about Akhenaten from uh, Egyptian history? I don't know. And then inserted him into the Torah. At least uh, it's hard to say because you can trace certain aspects of his origin. Uh, the uh, Like Freud thought that um, Moses was a monotheist, which uh, there's no that's really uh, just propaganda and legend, but that um, that he got the idea from Akhenaten, the monotheistic pharaoh of Egypt, but it's not that clear that, that uh, Akhenaten was a monotheist either. So yeah, that theory's kind of been put back into the closet. Um, the uh, the story of him being placed, his life being saved by placing him in the picnic basket and setting it adrift on the Nile, that's taken right out of the much earlier myth of Sargon's nativity, another Assyrian. Uh, and then all the major elements of Moses' biography are borrowed from the stories of Jacob in Genesis, which is slightly rewritten. And the vast number of Moses' stories are all ideological or ceremonial myths, having Moses propound some law or, ex or give a place a name that was symbolic, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and so there's, there's precious little actual information, really none about Moses. Uh, his name is, is even like half of an Egyptian name, um, like Tutmos. Uh, Thoth has begotten him. Uh, who knows uh, what the whole name was? and Who knows if he existed? I'm pretty sure he didn't. Um, so did the Babylonians, did, was there a uh, a Babylonian original that he might have been modeled on. I've never uh, read that. It's it's certainly possible, though. Mm, yeah, okay, we've seen that. Uh, do you know, uh, Crossover Maniac, do you know, oh, thanks for the super chat. Do you know anything about the movement to bring back the Norse religion, Odinism? Uh, what do you think of that from a theological perspective? Well, if it's anything like the kind of uh, stuff that uh, Margot Adler discusses in Drawing Down the Moon, uh, it's, it's uh, interesting that the people that worship the, the pagan gods don't seem actually to believe in these gods, that they have some ontological reality. It's like they say, you know, Jung was right. These things exist in a tenuous way as archetypes in the subconscious. And if we access those, um, well, as we do involuntarily when we dream about them, but if we access them in rituals, um, mimicking or reviving the the original uh, Norse, I mean, I don't know if we know enough about that, but when we do what we can to reenact the Norse religion, it will have the same effect as they did when the, the Norse people actually believed in Thor and Odin and so on. We happen not to, but maybe that's not the, uh, the, the price of, you have to pay for the ticket to do this. Um, um, religion is basically ritual using myth as a script and it doesn't necessarily depend on literal belief in these gods. Well, that's a pretty sophisticated view. And uh, Odinism, which is that the same thing as Asatru, which is some kind of Norse revival religion? I don't know. Uh, but um, uh, it, this is an attempt to uh, bring back pre-Christian European paganism. Uh, and paganism is not a bad word uh, here. I mean, just a non-Christian, pre-Christian 
um, view. Now, that's what the Nazis were trying to do. So it's very touchy to even bring this up because some people slide over into saying, oh, uh, Odinist, you must be a Nazi, an Aryan. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if some Norse revivalists were believers in the super race, but I don't know. I'm just ignorant of it. You, you certainly wouldn't have to be. Uh, you would be rejoicing in the, the grand tradition. That's why people like these TV shows like Vikings and stuff so much. That there's a nobility about this. Uh, naturally, people would say it's racist, but I, I don't think that's the case. It's just being proud of an aspect of your heritage. I mean, it doesn't mean a whole lot to me beyond my like and Thor comic books, but... Uh, but um, that's what I'm guessing is going on. I, I don't really know. Uh, so, good question. Mm. Uh, Asherah's Orchard, any thoughts on the Canaanite, uh, Canaanist movement of the 1930s through 60s, British Israel? or British Palestine. I was just reading a bit about that the other day, but the only thing I ever really knew about it was, and I know now that it's over simple, is that uh, some said that um, the British um, populace really stems from the lost tribes of Israel, and that the basis for that is uh, a bunch of names that, uh, like, they envision the lost tribes of Israel spreading out into Europe, and that they left certain names behind them as markers of their presence, like rivers. The Danube uh, must have been uh, important to the tribe of Dan. The Dnieper River, or Denmark, the Danes, uh, Danzig, and all that. Uh, I'm not so sure of that, right? There's such a thing as false cognates, but I'm not a linguist, and I don't really know, so I'm a bit skeptical, but again, I'm open to correction. This came up tangentially with Hal Lindsey and, and people trying to squeeze uh, predictions of modern events out of ancient prophecies. Like Ezekiel speaks of um, of uh, Gog uh, uh, and Magog and uh, uh, Tu uh, Tubal and uh, Meshech and all that uh, associated with the Scythians invading Israel and such. And as uh, prophecy mongers said, "Oh yes, Meshech that means Moscow in Russia." And uh, Tubal must refer to Tobolsk in Russia. I don't think so, right? In fact, Tubal was, they're mentioned in the Bible as a, a copper working tribe that lived on the shores of the Black Sea. Uh, Gog uh, was Gyges, the king of Midian. Magog simply means the land of Gog. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with a Soviet bloc or anything like that. Uh, and I and it sounds to me like British Israelism is based on the same sort of word games. But again, I don't really know. Uh, I don't want to go off, uh, you know, on the basis of surmise. Got to look into it. Okay. Um... Asherah's Orchard again. Um, regarding the serpent and the uh, current Torah chapter, look at how Moses casts down the staff and it becomes a tannin derived from the tan root used in Nehushtan. Also, I would suggest Leviathan. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's quite interesting. Maybe the, uh, the I mean the snake must have been uh, uh, very uh, sacred to to worshippers of the sacred serpent. Very sharp-eyed. Very good. 
let's see. Uh, the Dusty Dud, uh, glad you're back doing uh, lives. Uh, lives, uh, questions and answers. Last time I watched you was on Critical Faculty channel. That was uh, um, Hanny Salem. I, I forget. Uh, good God, I can't believe that. Uh, in Australia. Uh, what happened with him, if you don't mind me asking? Well, he was away in Europe for a long trip, and I'm not sure what he's doing at the moment, but we're supposed to get back together sometime. And uh, he's still raring to go, apparently. He's just wound up doing other things. He's a very resourceful and talented fellow, that's for sure. Okay, um... Asherah's Orchard, I like uh, these questions. The word for serpent in Aramaic is uh, have, H-E-Y-V, you can see this yourself, slash W-A-H, which is so close to Chava that the serpent being called Eve is, ah, is, is likely derived from there. By the way, Asherite Alchemist is my other account. Oh, great, great. That's good. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. I didn't know that, and I'm glad to know it. Yeah, the serpent's name is Eve. Yeah. See, um, uh, another one from Asherah's Orchard. Moses may be from Mesuli, which was the name of Amen Mesa, who was the governor of Nubia. Meanwhile, there's a tradition of Moses being a king of Cush before being imprisoned in uh, Midian before marrying uh, uh, where are we here? Uh, before before marry, marrying Zipporah. He marries a Cush uh, a Cushite wife later on, I believe. Okay. Um, Jonathan Gandy says Hebrew is Greek with a mask on. Don't make me do it without the mask on. Uh, let's see. Asatru, also, oh, this is uh, Bishop Taylor. Asatru, also known as heathenry, is a modern revival of the pre Christian Norse slash Germanic spirituality. The term Asatru is derived from Old Norse words with Asatru meaning faith in the Aesir, you know, the gods of Asgard. Um, um, is there another follow-up to that, I suspect. Yeah, the Aesir are a group of gods in Norse mythology, including well-known figures like Odin, Thor, and Frigga. Yeah, right. Uh, then uh, Asat, yeah, okay, we uh, we already had that one. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, Asherah's Orchard says that uh, what I said about British Israelism, which is pretty fragmentary and ignorant, she says, no, that's not at all what I'm talking about. There was a cultural revival in British Mandate Palestine and later uh, in Israel. Canaanism was, was a culture and not cultural and ideological movement founded in 1939 that reached its peak in the 1940s among the Jews of a mandatory Palestine, you know, when, when it was a mandate of the League of Nations. It has had significant effect on the course of Israeli art. Huh, fascinating. Uh, let's see. Um... Uh, the movement promoted the idea that the land of Israel was that of ancient Canaan, or according to others, the whole of the Fertile Crescent in which ancient peoples and cultures had lived. Uh, let's see, Z. Stallone. Dr. Jackson Crawford is a good source for Norse mythology. He has a YouTube channel and once compared similarities between Havamal and Psalms. 
I don't even know what that is. So you, you, you beat me there. Um, oh, let's see. Okay, uh, Havamal, meaning the words of Odin, the Norse equivalent of Psalms. How interesting, wow. Uh, the Dusty Dud, uh, what do you think it would be like today if Christianity fizzled out with Paul? Do you think Europe would have stayed pagan, uh, Celtic, and Norse? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we'd all be Mithraists today, uh, because that was a big, big religion and the official religion of the Roman Empire. Of course, it could have been taken over by another, uh, because they did change national religions occasionally, but it, it wouldn't surprise me. But, as you say, it could be that Norse religion would have taken over, and uh, that would be really fascinating. Uh, I always like to say, as a comic book fan, that uh, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, in effect, revived the worship of the Norse gods, so that uh, thanks to the comic books and the movies, Thor has more devotees of a kind now than when he was a living god to, to uh, the Norse, uh, <laughs> for whatever that's worth. But I got plenty of Thor action figures. I'm a big fan, though not a worshiper. Okay, that's it for tonight. Uh, boy, was this an exciting one. Keep bringing those questions.